Greetings, people of Earth. Have you ever wondered what would happen were there to be an illicit liaison between a VW Sharan and a Maybach? Until I mentioned it, probably not. And if you thought the answer was a Mercedes V-Class, you're wrong, because it is in fact the star of today's video, the Toyota Alphard. Why then is it that I'm introducing this video here, and not, as I usually do, in the car, instead being in my evil volcano lair slash edit suite? Well, the answer is a simple but slightly embarrassing one. You see, the car I thought I was driving today was a Toyota Alphard Executive Lounge. It was indeed a Toyota Alphard. It had an Executive Lounge badge on it, the owner told me it was an Executive Lounge, and the Executive Lounge is a model made by Toyota. But about six years after the car that I drove in this video. Ordinarily, when I pick up on such a mistake, I will just try and edit around it. Unfortunately for me, because the car being an executive lounge was such a big part of the video, there is no way to do that. But other than getting the name wrong, everything that I've said in the video does still apply and I feel is still correct. So I figured the best solution was to present this little um, explanation to you at the beginning so you can understand what's going on. It's a Toyota Alphard 350L, not the executive lounge, as I'm about to call it 11 billion times. You have my apologies, sorry about this, and if anyone does have a real later executive lounge, or even better, the Royal Lounge, more on that in the video, please do get in touch, because as you'll see, I really love driving these rather rare and wonderful Japanese beasties. Thanks for your understanding. Before I tell you about this car, I would like to spend a moment telling you about its owner, because he is just as interesting. His name is Matthew. He's just 24. His first car was exactly the kind of thing you'd expect a young lad to buy, a 1.2 litre Polo, which he didn't get on with all that well, particularly when its engine failed. As a project, he decided to buy a 1958 Austin A35 which is um, a pretty extraordinary thing on its own. Then, to replace the Polo, he bought a Lexus LS430. And before you think that means he must have lots and lots of money to spend, the insurance cost him just £1,000. He enjoyed the luxury lifestyle in the Lexus, but then decided he wanted something a little bit different, so bought this. And uh, different it certainly is, particularly for a young man that also doesn't have an enormous family. It's just him and his massive seven-seater luxury JDM minibus. What does he do for a living? Well, that you're really gonna love. He restores Triumph Stags. Yeah, and if you'd like to see a video talking about that with him, please hit the comment section down below and tell me, because I think you would. Anyway, on to the Alphard. This is one of a number of MPVs which are very popular over in Japan. You have things like the Honda Elysian and the Nissan L Grand. Here, they are somewhat cult heroes, having some very dedicated owners groups. But the Alphard is generally regarded by many as one of the safest bets, being a Toyota. It was introduced in 2002, and the second generation launched in 2008, of which this is a member. That was facelifted in 2011, before being replaced by the third generation in 2015, which is still in production. You had a choice of different engines, a 2.4 litre 4, a 2.4 litre 4 with a hybrid, and a 3.5 litre V6, as you see here. All of them have some flavour of automatic gearbox, this being a six-speed. You also got the option of all-wheel drive on certain models, but most of them are front-wheel drive, as is this. 
Being Japanese, of course, they couldn't keep things simple. And so there were actually two entirely separate versions of this car sold from different Toyota dealers. You had the regular Alphard, which is this, that you could buy from a Toyopet dealer. Or you could have the Velfire, which is essentially the same thing, but with slightly sportier and more aggressive bumpers front and rear aimed at the more youthful crowd. And those you bought from a Nets store. In Japan, there isn't really such a thing as a Toyota dealership. They have many different branches selling different versions and classes of cars. Kind of like in America where you get the many different arms of Ford, General Motors and the like. As the differences between the two are largely inconsequential for the rest of this video, I'm just going to talk about the Alphard. As you might imagine, there were several different variants of the car that you could choose from. I've driven a regular Alphard, one of the base models, and it was a very fine thing. Nice to drive, with a decent, responsive, if not overly powerful V6 engine, and plenty of space in the back. More or less all of them have an element of configuration, so you can run them as a five-seater, a four-seater, or even if you want, a two-seater with an enormous boot, essentially a van. However, at the top of the tree, you get some really quite interesting variants, and the most luxurious, sumptuous, and desirable of them all is the Royal Lounge. And this is a model which is a semi-official conversion, not actually built by Toyota. They supply it to a company called Modelista, and what they do is remove all the rear seats and replace them with two super luxurious chairs. It really is a first-class lounge in the back of a minivan. As you might expect, those are a reasonably rare sight even in their home market, and doubly so here. But they do exist, and if you want to get your hands on a fairly new Royal Lounge, it can be done. But expect to part with some £120,000. And I suppose that sounds like a lot of money. But seriously, look in the back of one and tell me that doesn't look like a £120,000 car. And more importantly, one of the key distinctions between this and your equivalent Mercedes, which really would be the V-Class, is that the V-Class was designed first as a van, which was then converted into something more upmarket. However, this was designed first and foremost as a car, and I think is all the better for it. Now, this is not the Royal Lounge, it is the one below, the Executive Lounge. So you don't have just two seats in the back, you have the full five. I have spent a little bit of time today in the back of this, and it is a fabulous place to be. But I know viewers of this channel aren't simply interested in luxury features and gimmicks. I am not supercar blondie. Instead, you want to know how a car drives. And as we appear to be approaching one of my favourite bits of B-Road, I suppose, as inappropriate as it may be, I should find out. So I'm going to move the shifter over to sport mode. There are no paddles behind the wheel. Put my foot down and find out. It probably won't surprise you to hear that doing that sort of thing isn't really this car's happy place. However, I think now having done that, to call this a Japanese Rolls Royce doesn't really feel that inappropriate. And that really leads me on to the one big thing about this car that makes me love it so much, and indeed many others just like it. And that is the fact that in the Western world, over really the last sort of 50 or 60 years and probably going beyond that, our idea of luxury has changed somewhat. And today, luxury means having a car which is naturally very expensive, very well appointed, but also a serious performer. And I think that is where we're going wrong. You see, I suspect that just about nobody involved in the design and production of this car thought, hey, should we take it around the Nürburgring? Because no owner was actually ever going to do that. Nobody cared, because let's face it, the simple fact is, and I believe it's just as true for a Toyota Alphard as it is a Range Rover SVR, the vast majority of people spend quite a bit of time in urban areas, and though they may not be quite as dense as Tokyo, still there is traffic. And when you've got traffic, 600 horsepower and a big supercharged V8 isn't really going to help you, well, 
at all. But in order to make sure that these cars can go round a bend for when you do find a nice clear bit of road, they've been engineered in such a way that they'll obviously do it without causing you any harm. And in that process, they kind of ruin the luxury element. I think just about every modern Bentley, apart from, and it pains me to say, the Bentayga has suffered from this. And oh dear, oh somebody's got this bend very, very wrong in a Ford car. Very, very wrong. You see, I've been out in the old Mulzan, and though it's a brisk car, you put your foot down and it will move, it doesn't exactly love going around a bend, it will do it, but under protest. However, it exudes luxury at all times. It is incredibly comfortable, a real old school luxury car. The new generation of Bentleys though, the Continental, the Flying Spur, they're lovely to drive and when you put your foot down, they'll do things that you really wouldn't believe. However, the rest of the time, they're just a little bit too stiff a little bit compromised and they're not simply put that enjoyable to be in and for me that defeats the whole point of a luxury car to my mind a luxury vehicle should focus on a feeling of light space and quality of materials with the engine being merely a supporting act and the alfard nails this brief for me the v6 is the natural choice because from a luxury perspective what you really want are smoothness of power delivery and a broad power and torque band these are far more important than headline numbers therefore the naturally aspirated six cylinder three and a half liter v6 here paired with a torque converter automatics is an excellent tool for the job it makes 270 horsepower which is enough and i prefer to think of it as adequate in the tradition of the old rolls royces Here, meanwhile, in the Japanese minivan, things are much better because, though you can feel the odd lump and bump in the road, this car is very, very nicely damped. Even at speed, even when trying to press on, it's still reasonably plush, reasonably compliant. It doesn't actually even roll all that much. And more than that, the car is certainly long, at about 4.9 metres, but that makes it shorter than just about any luxury car I can actually think of. Jaguar XJ, BMW 7 Series, Mercedes S-Class, they're all now over 5 metres, apart from the Jaguar, which is, of course, dead. And this car is quite narrow, about 1.8 metres, and that actually is really significant because the issue I have with Mini and SUV is how broad they've become. And that means that for roads like this, they can be just a little bit terrifying because you're taking up nearly all your side of the road, then someone somewhere is probably also driving a dirty great big SUV and they'll be taking up all of their side of the road and sometimes a little bit of your side as well. And it doesn't take a genius to work out, that isn't going to end very well. This though, no problems whatsoever. I can see the back and sides of this very nicely. This car has been upgraded with a little rear view camera up here that sits in the back. And the reason that's there is because this car has the, I'm told, very rare central headrest at the back, which is quite a cool little design, sort of folds over a little bit. Those are a few hundred pounds on their own, and many people take them out and subsequently lose them because it obscures your rear vision. This gets you around that problem. And while we're in the back, let's talk about it, shall we? As you can probably tell, in its default configuration with all the seats in place and the rears more or less as far back as they'll go, you don't have masses of boot space. However, that rear row of seats will also slide forwards, backwards, and if need be, fold out the way too, or should you desire, be completely removed. The centre seats, though, are of greater interest, and that's what makes this the executive lounge. They are very luxurious things, leather covered with nice big sides. They're like proper armchairs. You also have a little ottoman that'll come out so you can rest your feet on, and this seat also has a little mat for you to rest your feet. Very, very nice. The seat will recline quite a way, and it really is equivalent, I would say, to business class travel. This car is also equipped with the home theatre stereo system that has no fewer than 18 speakers and a little fold-down screen here. There's a DVI port down below, so if you can find something with that connection, you can plug in your old PlayStation 2 and have a little bit of fun while you're on the move. The stereo system is actually really quite good, though, being Japanese, it won't get all that many of our radio stations, but mercifully, it does have an AUX in. 
for Doug DeMuro fans out there, one of my favourite features about this car is that it has seven seats and 14 cup holders. They're just about everywhere that you look. You've got some down here, you've got some down here. Oh, and my favourite bit, you have a smuggler's compartment. So this little central armrest moves fore and aft. And under it is another sort of central console that you can fit quite a bit in actually presumably some uh, illicit merchandise or more than likely some manga figurines happily though this clearly is a car designed for the person in the back the driver has not been overlooked and it's still a very nice place to be you have the indicators on the japanese side to the right which i actually do quite like you've got a nice little armrest here which can move out your way if you need it and i think actually really does make things a little bit comfier for longer journeys. You've also got all the standard controls you would expect and the side doors are electric too. And that in fact I think is one reason alone that would make this a car that anybody with young children should really consider over just about any SUV because let's face it even if children are of an age where you trust them enough not to have a child lock on the car they're not really very delicate with opening doors are they? They like to just sort of go like that but having a sliding door gets you around that problem so you just press a button or pull the handle and this will then electrically move back same thing it will then close you can even do it off the key as well you have multi-zone climate control you've got a panel for it up here and one in the back too the dash is also really quite nice and brushed aluminium look for the surrounds of the dials and it's it's quite a classy affair i really do like it very elegant very simple very japanese You do have parking sensors, front and rear, and you've also got one of my favourite little Japanese things. You've got the tiny little mirror over there that shows you the very front and very side of the car, meaning even in the tightest of spaces, you can park this easily. Far more useful than a 360-degree camera because those, as soon as the cameras get dirty, are absolutely useless. And uh, I've known many people with cars that have got sensors, cameras and buzzers everywhere still find a way of backing it into a tree. Here, that's a little bit less likely. And if you didn't have the digital rearview mirror, you'd have the regular one. And the benefit of this car being essentially, well, shed-shaped, is that the rear of the car, the glass, is the rear of the car. You have a pair of sunroofs, a fairly small one up here, and a much bigger one in the middle, meaning it feels nice, light, airy. There's loads of space in here too. And this is another one of the things I don't get about 4x4s, particularly stuff like the G-Wagon. Now, the G-Wagon is a proper off-road. It's a serious piece of kit. But let's be honest, just about every single one of them that you've spotted near Sloan Square is somewhat unlikely to hop off to the Amazon at the weekends. And the simple fact is that in order to build a car which is a proper, durable, rugged off-roader, you have totally compromised it as a luxury vehicle. So, though your G-Wagon might be nice, fast, rorty, particularly in AMG guys, it's phenomenally expensive. You're talking close to £200,000, I think, for a fully specced one. And even the diesel that I drove was 120 grand. And the fact is, in terms of road manners, this is better. Doesn't have steering that's quite as good. I will give it that. And there's a few more cheaper materials in here, but it's also a little bit more consistent. It does, however, have acres more space, just miles and miles more, because it doesn't have to be lifted off the ground. It doesn't have that separate chassis, which a proper off-roader does. And this, of course, does not need. So you've got lots and lots of room. This is a benefit not just to little ones, but old ones too, you see. A lot of elderly people, they don't fold quite as neatly as they used to. And for them, having a nice big electric door they can just walk into, that's of great benefit. As you can probably tell, I really quite like this. Now, how much are you going to have to pay to get into one? Because the top of the line brand new Royal Lounge, that's 120,000 quid. And that, I think, and I admit, is a pretty hard sell because to just about anybody it's a toyota minibus and in their head probably worth about 20 grand which is convenient because that is what this is probably worth this coincidentally is going to be going up for sale soon and i'll put a link in the description down below if you want to buy it if there's no link that means it's already gone and if you're watching this in 2026 and expecting it still to be for sale um <clears throat> check the dates on your videos before you comment please if you're wondering what matt is on the hunt for next currently he's got his eyes on a toyota yaris gr4 of course 
Good lad. Though over lunch, I'm going to be trying to talk him into a GRMM because I think he should, uh, you know, take his time a little bit. Insurance on this for a young man was actually a little bit more than in the Lexus. That cost a thousand pounds a year, this 1400. A large part of that may have been because insurers didn't really seem to know what it actually was. It was very, very difficult to actually find someone that could just insure it. And because he's younger, he therefore wasn't able to get a lot of different policies that specialists would be able to do if you were a little bit older. Fuel economy is not so bad. Around town, the hybrid is a little bit better. And in case you were thinking this is the hybrid, no, it's not. Someone's put the badges for a hybrid on it. That was done in Japan, and uh, he's left them on because, well, someone in Japan did it, so that's how it's meant to be. Why not? On the motorway, apparently, there isn't actually a huge difference in the fuel economy between the 6 and the 4. This achieves over 30 to the gallon, 30 to 35 you will get, which for something that weighs 2 tonnes and has as much space as this with the aerodynamics of a brick, I think is not all that bad. And if you were to compare it with just about any big performance SUV, that's brilliant. Fantastic economy. Around town, it doesn't do quite so well. Closer, really, to about 20. As you might imagine, when it comes to things like getting parts, that can be a little bit tricky. Your average UK Toyota dealer doesn't really carry much in stock for these, but some of them can get stuff in, and if they can't, there's a website called Amiyama, which I'm told is very helpful for sourcing that kind of thing. They also do parts for stuff at the Toyota Century. That's another example of a great Japanese luxury car, and honestly, I think they've taken the best possible approach because they've looked at a car and gone, you know what? Does anybody actually really care about it being fast? No, great. In that case, we're not going to worry about compromising it in that regard. We're just going to make it the most luxurious and practical thing that we can. Japan, being limited on space, wants to make use of every single little bit that it has. And so, a car being this shape just makes sense. 4x4s, though I do have a bit of a, a weird love for them, they aren't very space efficient. The sexier, sleeker ones, half of them is bonnet. Look at the new Ferrari Puro Sang or Puro Sangue, whatever you want to call it. That's just weird. It's not as sleek looking as the old GTC4 Lusso. Must be compromised in some way, shape, or form, regardless of how much effort Ferrari have put into it. I mean, just look at it. The centre of gravity has to be higher. It's also heavier, worse on CO2, and in my mind, just not what a Ferrari should really be about. It's an example of modern-day compromise and Western people wanting something that is just fundamentally stupid. It's simple as that. It's just a daft car. This, though, I can really, really get on board with. And for 20,000 quid, I tell you what, it's a heck of a lot of car. Matthew is clearly suffering from some sort of temporary insanity because as one person on your own, it is entirely and completely inappropriate. He and I must be distant relatives because I think I suffer from the same insanity on account of the fact that I'm currently sat here going, hmm, yeah, these are quite a good idea. And the petrol head in me is going, yeah, but James, for the same money, you can go and get a Cayenne Turbo. But the sensible side of me, and it does exist, I assure you, is saying, yeah, but why? You've got fast cars. Why don't you get one of these? It's the same size on the ground as a Cayenne, a first gen one anyway, and it's got a lot more space inside, is much comfier, much better damped. Sure, it doesn't go anywhere near as well and you can't have quite as much fun in it, but do you really care about that? I'm just, well, uh, uh, um, can I take the fifth? In any case, this is a cracking car. A really, really cool way to get you and your family from A to B. And I think, whether they're young or old, this is just a much, much better place to put people than in the back of just about any 4x4 I can think of. I know to many people this may seem like just about as far away from luxury as you can possibly imagine, a Toyota minivan, but I assure you, that's only because you haven't tried it. I quite like it, in case you couldn't tell. Anyway, I want to say a big thank you to Matthew for bringing his car out today, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.